Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is John Karasik of the Robert E. Redding National Capital Area Alumni Chapter, and I'm here to introduce uh, Ellen Sass Douglas. Uh, Ellen is a member of the uh, Henry Chapter at the University of Richmond, and she has been helping students prepare for the bar exam for over 15 years. As a founding employee for Themis Bar Review, She's focused on developing a course platform that utilizes the best practices in online education to ensure that Themis courses meet students' needs and set them up for success in law school and on the bar exam. While in law school, Ellen served as the Henry Chapter Treasurer and later worked as the Director of Chapter, chapter Operations, as well as volunteered as an ADJ for District 23. I remember that. Uh, <laughs> and, and DJ for District 11. Uh, she's also an adjunct faculty at Loyola Chicago College, uh, School of Law. Uh, in her spare time, Ellen enjoys distance running, traveling with her family, and cheering on her two children as a hockey slash swim slash soccer slash dance mom, occasionally all on the same day. Uh, it is very much my pleasure to introduce uh, Ellen Sass Douglas. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, and nice to see everybody on here. Um, I was thinking this morning, I was wondering this morning and trying to jot down all the conventions I attended. And I, this is definitely the first virtual one. Um, but I think this is number seven, possibly number eight. So it's all starting to blend together. <laughs> um, but my first was back in uh, 2002 in, uh, in Scottsdale there. So... Um, well, thank you for joining me today. Um, while, uh, while we're here and together, I always, um, on, especially on these Zooms, and since I've been teaching on Zoom, um, I always um, welcome questions. So don't um, be afraid to interrupt me if, if something I say doesn't make sense or if you um, want me to clarify something. I like to treat these more uh, as a dialogue um, rather than uh, me sitting up here in my uh, dining room here outside Chicago, um, talking to all of you. So as we get started here, and I think everybody kind of has the raise hands functionality for those of you that don't have the video going, but those of you that do, you can actually raise your hand. I just want to take a poll of who's attending um, the session and kind of understand um, where all of you are at in your legal career. So current law students, anyone? All right. Any recent grads that are studying for the bar exam right now or just recently took it? All right. Well, I need to give a shout out to all of you because this is one of the craziest um, bar exam study periods that I have ever seen. And I have been doing this, as John said, for over 15 years. So for those of you that just sat for your exam last week, congratulations. For those of you that are continuing to study, um, good luck to all of you. Um, way to go with all of your with your perseverance um, during this time. And if after this, after I finish up talking about kind of time management part of this, we are doing an ask me anything. So um, while I'm certainly not a substantive expert, um, I'm happy to answer any strategies, questions, or just kind of talk about um, what this summer slash fall bar exam session has been. So, and then any um, attorneys? I know John. <laughs> Raising his hand. All right. Well, thanks for humoring me with that. My PowerPoint doesn't want to go. All right. So this is the time management, the secret skill for bar exam success and bond, um, presentation. Um, but before we get into the time management angle, I always like to start with what we actually are managing our time for, right? I wouldn't be doing my job uh, in the industry that I am if I didn't talk a little bit about um, the bar exam. So we all know this summer is uh, completely different um, and let's hope we don't have another one like it. Um, but usually the bar exam is administered um, on the last Tuesday and Wednesday of February and July. It's a two day exam. The first day being the SAD or what's known as the SAD and the second day being the multi-state bar exam or the MBE. Um, unless of course you're in Louisiana and you don't administer the MBE and they're an entirely uh, different animal there. So the bar exam now, as opposed to even five years ago, is really divided into sort of two categories, the UBE jurisdictions, 
um, which is now administered in 36 states and uh, the non-UBE jurisdictions. So these are um, the states. I'll check in with um, you guys later about which one you're taking, but um, this is, these are the states that administer the uniform bar exam. And these are the states that are currently administering um, their own exams. So a lot of them are doing, with the exception of Louisiana, they do use the MBE, which is um, administered by the, written and administered by the National Conference of Bar Examiners or the NCBE, but then there's a state um, specific portion to it. So uh, by another quote show of hands here, and let me switch to my gallery view so I can see you all. Um, who on here uh, is taking a UBE jurisdiction or has taken a UBE jurisdiction? Anyone in that non-UBE category? All right. So, okay, great. So I, when I do these presentations, I generally stick to the um, non-UBE information. <laughs> it is just weird, Tanisha, it would be UBE. But taking it in October, it's completely different. Um, so stick to some of the UBE, but I will address some of the different state um, state differences throughout here. All right, so the uniform bar exam, the primary difference for it is there's no state specific law. Uh, the, it's what we refer to as black letter law. The non-UBE states don't do this. Um, they do test on the black letter law for the MBE, but they want their state distinctions in there. So even if you're seeing some of those same multi-state subjects, um, they do want you to know the, the state differences for that, whether, um, whether there's just a few, some of, the, some of the subjects have quite a few, some of them have very little, but you need to be able to, on day two, talk about the black letter law, but on day one, put in your state uh, differences there. Um, the reason why the UBE has picked up tra such traction and is so attractive to students when they're taking it has to do with the, the transferability of those scores, right? Um, even when I sat for the bar exam way back when, um, you're virtually guaranteed of having to sit for another one at some point in your legal career if you intended to move or practice elsewhere. The UBE, though, now allows you to take that score if you've achieved a passing score and literally go to any of those states um, and wave in. So the reciprocity um, is very friendly with those UBE scores. Speaking of those passing scores, the UBE exam is scored on a 0 to 400 score range. The passing scores are actually dictated by the states themselves, and they can range between 260 and 280. The average, though, people often ask, um, is about 266. That seems to be the bulk of the states are in that 266 or below range. So when anybody gets stressed out while they're studying and they need to think about that score, um, I always like to point this out as well. The average, that 266 out of 400, is a 66 and a half percent. So when's the last time you, put, you took a test and scored a 66 and a half? Somebody threw you a party for it. It's the bar exam, folks. So keep that in mind. It's the same thing with the MPRE, um, the scores oftentimes with students. Um, they get nervous when they see those 70s and 80s required. It's out of 150 for those of you that might be taking the MP upcoming MPRE here in November. Um, so keep that in mind. Still, it's an enormous um, undertaking and not one to be taken lightly. But if you need something to kind of mentally bring yourself back down on the stress level, keep in mind that it's usually about a, it's usually in the range of a 66 to 68 percent correct. Keep in mind with your UBEs as well, there may be some additional state requirements too that always come to mind. Missouri, for, I, for any of you in um, the state of Missouri, there's a 25 question online test that they need to do. It can be taken as many times as you need to. New York is the big one though, for those of you that might be taking the New York bar exam. You have your New York law course and you have the New York law exam. So just double check with your individual state jurisdictions there um, before you make any assumptions that um, the uniform bar exam is it. So what is the uniform bar exam comprised of? I indicated that um, day one is that essay day. Um, so depending on what state you're sitting in will depend on when the MEE comes into play, whether it's a morning session or an afternoon session. I have afternoon session here because here in Illinois, um, that will be your after lunch session. The components, there's six essays that are intended to be about 30 minutes each in completion. 
You can have one or more subjects per essay, and these are testing on those majority principles. This will count as 30% of your overall score. The other portion that you're going to see on day one is called the multi-state performance test, often referred to as the MPT. This is um, intended to take, those two are intended to take 90 minutes each. And when I say it's a closed universe in a fictional jurisdiction, it's the most, it's a legal writing exercise in short, right? You're going back to your legal writing classes and they give you everything that you need to know. One of my favorite things to tell students um, when we're talking about the MPT is this, this should be your favorite part of the exam, right? Because you don't have to, all the, those laws that you needed to memorize, all those rules you needed to memorize, you don't need to know anything for this portion because that library, that file, that um, question that they're going to give you will have everything that you need to know. So that said, just because you don't need to memorize the law for this portion doesn't mean that you should take it lightly. Um, a lot of students who do end up having trouble with their scores on the bar exam, it has to do with the performance test. A lot of times, so there's a couple different reasons for that. One being, it's a legal writing exercise. You assume after three years of law school and possibly working that you don't need to necessarily practice how to write. Really not the right um, mindset. You do need to practice these under those time conditions. The other reason they do that um, is because it takes up a lot of time in your practice, right? A 90 minute question, in 90 minutes, you could practice three of those MEE essays or you could do 50 multiple choice questions, right? So dedicating a full 90 minutes to doing a practice performance test can seem a lot um, in, your, in your study time, but I will tell you that it is well worth it. You do not want to be walking into the exam day um, having the first time you're writing a full MPT be for the bar exam. The day two component of the exam is the multi-state bar exam, otherwise known as the MBE. It will be a morning and an afternoon session, each consisting of 100 questions. So 200 multiple choice questions um, in total, bringing that to an average of 1.8 minutes per question. Again, that's the average you're shooting for um, for those of you sitting for the bar exam right now, especially those of you in October, you're kind of just maybe at the beginning of your studies, you're still doing some of those single subject, multiple choice questions. Um, you don't need to be necessarily worried if you're going over that time. Also, the different subjects within this exam will take different amounts. It'll take you longer to do a constitutional law question than a criminal law question. So just keep in mind it's an average and keep in mind that as you begin to study, you don't necessarily need to be hitting that 1.8 minutes per question mark. So what is the big deal about this uh, exam? Why do students may be, uh, feel intimidated by it? One, it's a multiple choice exam, and that's not really something that's familiar after many years of law school, right? We're used to essays, we're used to writing papers, um, but those multiple choice questions, a couple, some schools and some professors have started to integrate it more. Um, but overall, it's not the type of exam that you're going to see while in law school. So it's kind of a new, a new challenge for you as you start studying. The other thing that makes this so difficult is that it's a best answer test. And what that means is at some point you may be looking at these answer choices and the correct answer choice that you need to pick isn't necessarily correct or totally correct, but it's the best one out of those four. It gets you closer to answering that question. So, and again, this becomes something, um, it's, it's a nuance for this exam. And as you do more practice questions, you'll start to recognize those and understand um, that you're not always going to get the absolutely correct answer. The multi-state bar exam portion, by the way, is scored by the NCBE. So what that means is every person, um, regardless of your jurisdiction that takes the MBE, you will all be scaled, your scores will all be scaled together versus those um, essays and the MPTs, which are scored by your state. And the multi-state bar exam takes up 50% um, of your score. So the subjects tested here, these are the UBE, the MBE uh, has those eight subjects. There are 25 scored questions in each of those areas and then 25 test questions that pull from each of those eight subject areas. On your essay portions, and this does apply in most jurisdictions as well, you will see those MBE subjects again, but they will be state specific when you're not doing a UBE exam. 
For the UBE, it will be the same law that you apply for the MBE and the MEE essays. In addition to that, you have agency, partnerships, corporations. Some of the um, non-UBE jurisdictions uh, will refer to it as domestic relations. Um, conflict, conflicts of law, secured transactions, trusts, and wills. There are some of the states, I can always, I always think of Virginia, um, since I went to school at the University of Richmond. They have a couple of additional subjects. Local government law was always one that kind of threw me for a loop. Um, Virginia civil procedure. Uh, in California, there's the community property um, subject that gets added in there as well. So again, know your exam. I do see a question. I'm happy to, is Elizabeth? I can, I can. Can we take her off mute? I think I can. Uh, maybe. Elizabeth, I think I unmuted you. Elizabeth Mayberry, Henry Chapter from the University of Richmond. Um, Hi, Elizabeth. I like, uh, it's nice to meet another spider. <laughs> we have another one in the chat as well. Um, so my question is, a lot of these for the October exam are changing to 100 questions that the MBE is providing. Correct. So how would these change to match the 100? It's essentially cut in half, is our understanding. So um, 13 or 12, probably from each subject there, and then the test questions. But essentially, what you're going to be doing is two 50-question sets rather than those two 100-question sets for the October bar exam. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we're moving into the time management portion here. Does anybody have any questions um, on kind of the format of the exam or the uniform bar exam or the subjects tested? And again, if something comes up, we can do it at the end as well. All right. So time management, what is it? Time management is the act or practice of managing and supervising your time. So what exactly does that have to do with the bar exam and why am I talking to you about it? Well, when Themis launched back in 2008, it was the first of its kind. We were the first fully online bar review course. Over the last decade, we've seen this change quite a bit. And most companies are offering uh, an online course or an online version of their classroom-based course. But we've also noticed that even where when we poll students afterwards and we look at some of the demographics that come in and we do our own, we do our own studies, even where students have opted for a classroom-based course, you see a steep decline as people lean towards the flexibility of studying where they want versus having to be in a classroom setting every day. This summer, it was a necessity, right, to have that online component. And the flexibility itself of online learning is not bad in and of itself, but where you aren't prepared to, for the time management piece, for the scheduling piece, for the pressures that come into having sort of the flexibility around such a huge undertaking, it's very easy for students to become overwhelmed and fall behind in their schedule, especially when you consider other factors that are now coming into play. So, with the, we interview our FEMA students. We do a survey each year um, asking students what subjects they took in school, kind of where they fell in the class rank pack, and another, um, what other bar exams they've taken. It helps us get an understanding of who our students are and how best to advise them. One of the questions that we ask them has to do with whether they're working part-time or full-time or not working and able to dedicate themselves entirely to their studies. We've seen students answering yes, to part-time or full-time work increased from 12% of our students to 48% of our students last year who are working um, while they're intending to study for the bar exam. So long gone are the days, it seems, of the luxury of having all day to study. People are balancing um, a lot more professional and personal obligations. Additionally, the average age of the law student, when you look at some of the demographics of people entering law school and thus graduating, um, people are a little bit older. They're taking some time off out of school, even that two or three years. And with that comes other family obligations. 
And then there's this convenience lifestyle. And I wasn't quite sure what to call, to call it, but it has to do with our accessibility, right? We are so accessible. You can probably, I can probably show you on my camera. I don't know if you can see the tan line from my iWatch. I actually took my iWatch off for this presentation so that I wouldn't be distracted by the flurry of group texts and CNN alerts and New York Times alerts. Like I had to take it off and put it all away. And with that though comes the expectation, not necessarily our own expectation that we have to be available while we're studying, but people don't necessarily understand, our parents, our friends, our children, our significant other, that you need to be inaccessible during this time. And there's the added pressure of wanting to be accessible, right, while also trying to prioritize this. So this is generally what I call my bar exam wake-up slide when I go through this um, with my students. So. We always get asked the question when we're talking to students about their study approach or the bar exam itself. And the, question, the big question always is, well, how much time does it really take? Or I can treat this as a full-time job, right? 40 hours a week, Monday through Friday, done. Um, so there's approximately 500 hours of study time that you're gonna need to dedicate. And I say approximately because it could be a little less and it could be a little bit more um, depending on your learning style. But the solid average is 500. It doesn't sound terrible, but let's look, about, let's look over a course of the, a few weeks here, right? So I took um, eight weeks, nine weeks, and 10 weeks here. Nine weeks is about average, and I'm talking about the typical July bar exam, definitely not this summer. Um, but when you graduate from law school, you typically have about nine weeks um, to get yourself studying before that bar exam, right? Fe the February bar exam, guys, is a little bit tighter. So if you're a winter grad or you need to take, you need to take the bar again in February or you're taking a second bar, you should plan for a few less weeks, right, in the typical schedule. So what that means is actually on a typical nine-week schedule, you're talking 55 and a half hours of study time a week to get all of that in before the bar exam, which comes out to eight hours a day. And this is seven days a week. This is not Monday through Friday. This is seven days a week. Now, let's throw in some of those things we were talking about earlier. Are you working? How many hours a week are you gonna be working? Do you need to take any time off? Do you have upcoming weddings? Do you have parties? Do you have vacations? Do you have any personal obligations? And I'm preaching to the choir for any of you that have ever dealt with billable hours. Nine to five does not equal eight. Not in billable hours, not in bar exam study time. So even knowing these hours, we still hear this. I have to work full time, so I'm gonna study at night and on the weekends only. My sister's getting married and I'm the best man or I'm the maid of honor and I have to take the whole week off in July. I don't have childcare until 1 p.m. every day, so I can only study in the afternoons and evenings. And I wanna hang out with my girlfriend, boyfriend, friends every Saturday night. By the way, it's okay if you're saying these things. You do have to have a balance. Studying for the bar exam is an arduous task, but you can't do it all day, every day. It is good to have a little bit of extra time and to have some, have some study life balance there. So about the time management thing. So at, when I'm at work and my fellow colleagues at work, um, during the summer and during the February bar exam study time, we spend a lot of time talking to students. We get phone calls, we get emails, we make phone calls. And the number one thing that we end up talking to students about who are struggling are those that have fallen behind in their scheduled assignments. And this is usually due to the fact that they didn't plan out their schedule ahead of time. They didn't take the practice of time management into account and they just simply found out too late in their studies that they didn't have enough hours in the day to get everything done. And it happens a lot. So today, I'm gonna to walk you through a block schedule. I've shared um, this with a number of students over the years, and, and while it doesn't work for everyone, um, it has worked for a majority of students, and it at least um, gets them, while it may not, some may say that it's a key component to their success, others may not, 
but everyone says it at least takes the mental load and the stress of scheduling and figuring out how they're going to get everything done off their minds because they spend a little time in the weeks leading up to starting to study to take the time to do these four things. They plan, they prioritize, they schedule, and then they stick with it. Hey, Ellen, we have a question from Tanisha Henson from Pepper Sure. Chat. Tanisha, I think you're un see. You, well, you are unmuted. Let's, let's try you again. Well, her question okay. is... Okay, sorry, thanks. I was wondering why I kept trying to be unmuted, and I'm like, I didn't try to unmute myself. <laughs> um, okay, so the question was, because so many of the exams are going to be online, many jurisdictions are not allowing scratch paper at all. And I know one of the big things with, like, property in CivPro is diagram or die, so yes. how, and especially like for essays, what is, what, how, what's your recommendation for that? Is Themis adapting for that? Right, so um, what we are advising our students and what I personally think is a good idea to do, I'm a big um, bullet outline person when I'm outlining my essays or even my MPT. Um, I think I'm, a strong proponent of taking kind of half of that 30 minute timeline um, to, I used to say write out on scratch paper, but now using that space that you have to answer your question to kind of type out the sections almost in uh, shorthand of how you're gonna organize your essay. So whether you're using IRAC or CRAC, um, organizing those into those sections and then going back and filling in what you need to on the actual exam itself before you submit. Now, we are hearing from a couple of jurisdictions, depending where you're saying that they are gonna have an online scratch paper. We haven't seen any, um, we haven't seen any examples of this, um, but some of the FAQs we've seen have indicated uh, that you will have this online scratch paper, um, but they have not yet indicated whether you're gonna be able to copy and paste from that. Um, so as we get information about what it's gonna look like, um, we adapt our advice um, and our online platform to accommodate students to try to allow them to practice in the fullest uh, manner possible. And, and Tanisha had a follow-up. I don't think I fully, you know, it, it is going to be, I would practice, Tanisha, while you're doing your own um, practice essays, um, doing your outline on within your essay answer and kind of get into that mode um, for the next couple of weeks. Um, and as information comes out from your bar examiners, you know, maybe adapt that to using the notepad function on your laptop or whatever they're going to um, allow you to incorporate. Right. I, I'm not as concerned about the essay portion and the PT portion, but more so about the MBE, especially because, like you said, you know, we've only got 1.8 seconds or 1.8 minutes per question. And yes, some questions don't take that long, but for, like I said, Civ Pro and property, especially when you get into legal descriptions and recording, how, do, like, do we just pick A and move on with our lives? No, it is. So do you, I don't know if you're, I, so our themis um, questions, we have everything online. If your bar review course has um, an online component for your MBE questions, I would start, I would start doing them there and just um, adapting to not having to put that pencil to paper. I know it's, it's so strange and not anything we were expecting um, to have to do, um, but it really is, the more you can practice it now um, without the scratch paper and without, you know, underlining, um, it, it's the best you can do. And it looks like Leslie has a question for us. Or a tip. Or a tip. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was just going to supplement what Ellen was saying, and it's not the most comforting thought, but keep in mind that everyone else will be in exactly the same boat, yeah. and they won't be able to diagram those real property um, pictures either. <laughs> so um, everyone will be equally frustrated, and... Um, Sometimes that's the best we can hope for in these really difficult, challenging situations where everyone is struggling to do the best they can with what they have. Um, yeah. But 
if you've got the virtual scrap, if you're in a situation, I'm sorry, a jurisdiction that has the virtual scrap paper, then like Ellen is saying, if you can make those little notes on it, then, mm -hmm. then do so. Thanks, Leslie. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so back to time management. Unless there's, John, any other raised hands? Uh, not at the moment. Okay. Not at the moment. Awesome. All right, so planning. Step one, identifying your uh, personal and professional obligations during your study time. And I'm talking about making a giant list of them, folks. Literally sitting down and writing everything that's going to happen in May, in June, in July, or in December, January, and February. Um, and even starting to note how many hours you're going to be working during the day, what days you're going to be working. Um, then start to think about your logistics of your study time. This doesn't really go into block scheduling, but it's good to do, right? Um, and think about where you're going to be studying. If you're studying at home, where in your house are you going to be studying? Do you have enough privacy? Do you have an electrical outlet? Do you have a printer that works? Do you have decent Wi-Fi and light? All things that you want to kind of examine before you actually start sitting in an area. If you're not studying at home, where are you going to study? How long is it going to take you to get there? How many other people are going to be around you? And can you deal with that situation? And the last part of the plan is remember while you're doing the planning to focus on you, right? Are you a morning person? If you're not, then don't block schedule your study time in the morning. For God's sakes, do not do MBE questions or an essay question at 9 a.m. if you're not fully awake until, until 10 a.m., while you're doing your study time, you might, you, you're going to need to shift your, your rhythms there towards as you get closer to the bar exam so that you are awake. But while you're studying and you need to get that substantive learning out of the way, figure out um, how you best study and, stay, and, and work through that environment. Prioritizing. So once you have that giant list of personal and professional obligations going, um, take a look at it and be harsh, okay? What do you absolutely have to do, right? What is going to help you keep your sanity during the study time, right? Take a look at how much time out of the day that those obligations and responsibilities take and what their frequency is. Are there any or even put off short term while you're studying? And then take a look and see Oh, great. Apparently, my internet connection is unstable, John. So <laughs> um, get, the, get your version of the PowerPoint ready. I just got to know what it Okey is. Okie um, So take a look then, and what have you listed as the most important thing? Those are the things that you're going to want to block schedule first. Then you're actually going to sit down and schedule. And you want to make a realistic estimate chunks of time, right? I have in mine and in the template that John loaded earlier in chat that I was sharing with all of you, I have six blocks during my day because that's what works for me. And those blocks are consistent Monday through Sunday, right? Seven days a week. That might not work for you, but at least start thinking about it. Think about those blocks of time and whether you have different blocks of time Monday through Friday than you do on Saturday and Sunday, that's fine but at least note where those blocks are and then start putting in all of those prioritized activities, responsibilities, and obligations from your other list. Start assigning them into those blocks of time and be sure to schedule some downtime, right? Literally write in relax time or downtime or TV time. Make sure it's in there and try to avoid overcommitting right? Get comfortable with telling people no or not right now. And this is a, just a general life lesson, right? And one that it's taken, I'm still trying to master, right? It's difficult to do when you're not studying for the bar exam, but it gets worse when you are. So start practicing it now. Let people know, no, you can't come to that party. No, you can't pick up something from a store for them, or you can't do it right now. It, it is, and just remember, this is short term, right? You're talking hopefully eight to 10 weeks of your life. Um, and then you can go back to, to doing favors for everybody else. So this is my block schedule. Like I said, yours may end up looking a little bit differently. There is a fillable PDF 
um, in the chat function that everybody can download to their computer and um, use this as a, as, a, as a basis for their own. Um, but if you want to do this online, or you really should have this in paper and look at it um, when you do it. And it's okay to create, like I said, a Monday through Friday sheet, or it's um, in a Saturday and Sunday sheet if your time blocks are a little bit different. The practice of time management is about managing your time and supervising your time. So my schedule has little to do with yours, and your friend's schedule has little to do with yours. So make it work for you. This is me studying for the bar exam. Pretend me studying for the bar exam, right? And if we take a look at this, I've built in some gym time. I've built in some free time. When you look down here, relax time. And everything is assigned to its time of day in those blocks of time. Now, this is where it becomes a really powerful scheduling tool for you. And it helps me and hopefully you avoid that there's not enough hours in the day trap that I talked about earlier that impacts so many bar exam takers. So I'm planning to study for nine weeks. We remember from that earlier slide that it's a 55, 55 and a half hours a week. Let's round up 56 hours a week that I need to allocate to studying. Having this in front of me, either on my computer or on a piece of paper, literally allows me to count and total up the number of hours I have. And I'm shooting for eight hours of study time a day. Or if I'm not going to get eight hours a day, I want to make sure I'm hitting around that 56 hours a week, right? If after I go through the skip block scheduling process, I don't have the hours that I need, I can go back to, to the drawing board. I can go back to that step two, my prioritization, and figure out, okay, is there something that I can take out? Or is there something that I can cut back on a little bit so it takes an hour instead of three hours, right? Or you may need to look at it and say, I'm not a traditional nine week studier. I'm gonna to need to do 10 weeks or I'm gonna to need to do 11 weeks because I need to fit all of this in. These are my highly prioritized items. And so I need to be able to study 45 hours a week or 40 hours a week and get it all in. So that's how you can use it. The other way I advise students to use it is once you've now figured it out and say, okay, this is gonna be my block schedule. This is how I'm going to study and work, and this is how many hours a week. When Cousin Sally gets married, and you know you have to go to Cousin Sally's wedding, um, Cousin Sally's wedding is Saturday, and there's a brunch on Sunday morning, and you'll be home by noon. You can take a look at your block schedule here and look and say, okay, I'm going to be missing my Saturday morning four hours. I'm going to be missing my, Sunday, my Saturday afternoon uh, four hours. And I can probably make this afternoon study. So I'm going to leave it there. You now know several weeks ahead of time of Cousin Sally's wedding that you need to figure out how to fit in an extra eight hours of study, either the week before the wedding, maybe after the wedding. But those eight hours just don't disappear into that hole of not having enough time, right? You can maybe add a little bit on that week. Um, the week before or the week after, maybe you skip your book club uh, Monday evening the next week to get back some of those hours. But that's how you use this tool then to plan ahead. This tool doesn't mean like, oh, I can't go to Cousin Sally's wedding because I have to study. I have, two, I have two blocks of time on Saturday. What it does is allow you to just continuously plan ahead. So um, if you haven't already... And I hope everybody will play along with me here um, and give you an opportunity to ask questions. Um, I thought we could do a little bit of an in-session exercise with block scheduling. If you want to do it toward for the bar exam, if you want to do it for your own personal work schedule, you know, your own summer life or, or class schedule this fall, um, we can go ahead and do it. Um, but first, I want to give you a few minutes here for step one. Let's associate your days with chunks of time and assign the number of hours. So take a look at your week. You can use my template that's loaded in the chat there as a guide. Maybe my template works. Um, but let's take a look at your calendars really quickly here. Uh, and I'll give you, I don't know, we'll do three minutes um, to kind of block out your day. All right, guys, I figured I'd give you a moment. Anybody have any questions on their time blocks or want to volunteer? Any, 
any concerns about them or uh, how they set up their week? I guess my question is, especially this summer with the constant changing of timing, how do you kind of adjust your schedules when you get this constant change of, well, I'm doing, my system says I need to do this many hours a day, but now I'm doing more hours of studying than the system says, but now they've moved the exam again. Like, how do we balance these? Yeah, well, um, I actually, I, I, I address it in, in step four with stick with it. You do have to kind of review your schedule um, throughout and make adjustments, especially this summer. Um, the constant moving has been stressful and a struggle, I know, for all students. Um, and you can incorporate uh, more review time. It allows you to go back and um, add in some of those study hours. You know, for a while we were like, well, everybody, you know, kind of wants an extra week or two to study, after, you know, when it comes around to bar exam time. But, but studying full on for July and then having, you know, it moved to September and then moved to October, um, you don't necessarily need that much time. So what we've been advising students is sometimes if you need to take a break, this has been a mental strain on, I think, everyone um, since, frankly, the beginning of the year. Um, but definitely since March when most everybody had to go into shelter in place and convert to online learning quickly and um, kind of deal with, with the summer the way we have. Um, I don't think anybody should be afraid to take a couple of days for themselves, especially when you've been sort of, you know, I, I hesitate to call it a, a, that you've been gifted <laughs> um, some extra time. It's, it's really not a, you know, it's not a present that you want, but um, taking some time to kind of regroup and spend some time with family that maybe you thought you had to ignore um, or see less of um, while, while you were studying this summer, um, you now can do that. Um, and then revisiting kind of how you want to prioritize your day. Did you give up some things that would actually make you happy and help the bar exam study process go a little more smoothly for you? And can you incorporate them back in? Um, so you do have that extra time to do that. But yeah, I'm, you know, and I hope that answered your question. It's, it's one of these things, like I, I do not have definitive answers for this experience. It has, um, it is a truly unique bar exam session happening here. Is there another, oh, we got it. There's, all right, so next session here to keep you guys rolling along um, uh, uh, kind of on this time management process. Every time I come off there. All right, so now let's do a giant brain dump. This is the, the brain dump I talked about earlier where you list out all of your obligations and your activities on a weekly basis. Um, are you working, uh, your fall classes, um, parenting, uh, babysitting, dinner with your significant other, your book club, your soccer team, um, if you're allowed to, to continue to do those things right now. Um, get them all sort of out on a piece of paper. Um, and on there, when you're prioritizing and putting those activities out, note the number of days um, that it's happening, days of the week, and even the time of day that you're going to be doing them. Um, and I'll just give you another three minutes there to do that. All right, make sure I'm off mute here. So while everybody is kind of still <laughs> filling in their activities and whatnot, does anybody have any questions on um, and filling those in or how they prioritized or how much time to give something? And there's a reason they say time management is a practice um, because it does, nobody gets it right their first time and it's always constantly evolving. So if uh, you're feeling a little lost or um, not sure if what you put together works, you just try it out um, and see um, and see if those blocks of time work for your day, if that's actually how your day translates um, into real life uh, and you learn from there. So. Uh, and that last step I mentioned, the fourth step there is stick with it, right? And I don't mean stick with your block schedule, that first one that you make. I just mean stick with the practice of time management, right? Not everything works. Things sometimes don't work. 
on a given day. One off day doesn't mean you throw out the entire schedule, right? Maybe note that, regroup, and then start your next day on that schedule and see if it works for you. Be aware that things will change. Um, this summer is the perfect example of that. Don't be afraid to stop and reevaluate and redo your schedule as many times as you need to. And things come up. So planning ahead, cousin Sally's, cousin Sally's wedding, um, a friend's birthday party, an impromptu trip to the beach even. But planning ahead means that you plan for those surprises and you'll know how much time you'll need to make up with your studies, right? So stick with the practice of time management. Constantly embrace the fact that your schedule is really this evolving tool um, throughout your studies. Um, but make sure that you are constantly evaluating and monitoring the number of hours that you're getting in your week um, and, and sort of stick to that block schedule as much as you can. So my last little slide here, mastering time management puts time back on your side, right? So if you can get this practice down um, and get, go through this process before you start studying, um, even if you're in the middle of studying right now, uh, it would be worthwhile to go in and evaluate and look at your time if you're finding that you're not having enough time to get your stuff, get what you want to get done um, in a day in. Um, and if you're starting, if, if you're a law student and starting school this fall, start trying it with your classes and with maybe any extracurricular activities or jobs that you're doing um, so that when it comes time to planning for your own bar exam schedule, um, that you're always, uh, you're already well practiced at it. So that's my, that's my spiel on time management. I know we've had a couple of questions on the online scratch paper and kind of the MBE approach, um, which I think we're in the, in the Whova app there uh, earlier. Does anybody else have any questions? I'm happy to take a few minutes to, um, to answer them. All right, well, John, I don't think anybody. Nope, doesn't, doesn't seem like right. there are, I don't see any other questions or, or or hands raised, so so I think I think that's it. So, uh, well, thank you all for for showing up and 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 uh, and participating. And and Ellen, thank you so much. Uh, this this was this was fantastic. Uh, this has been such a weird weird year for for uh, for bar exams, and uh, uh, it's 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 really terrific for you to to come and share your your. Uh, experiences uh, with us. So, so, so thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me. And um, I hope everybody has a, a fun and productive convention. And uh, I look forward to seeing everybody in person uh, at the next one there in, in uh, 2022. Definitely. <laughs>